Section 31 of Why Do We Need a Public Library? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Why Do We Need a Public Library? By Various. Section 31. Rights of Man. Part the First, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. By Thomas Paine. Part Three. I will here cease the comparison with respect to the principles of the French Constitution and conclude this part of the subject with a few observations on the organization of the formal parts of the French and English governments. The executive power in each country is in the hands of a person styled the king, but the French Constitution distinguishes between the king and the sovereign. It considers the station of king as official and places sovereignty in the nation. The representatives of the nation who compose the National Assembly and who are the legislative power originate in and from the people by election as an inherent right in the people. In England it is otherwise, and this arises from the original establishment of what is called its monarchy, for, as by the conquest, all the rights of the people or the nation were absorbed into the hands of the conqueror, and who added the title of king to that of conqueror, those same matters which in France are now held as rights in the people or in the nation are held in England as grants from what is called the crown. The Parliament in England in both its branches was erected by patents from the descendants of the conqueror. The House of Commons did not originate as a matter of right in the people to delegate or elect, but as a grant or boon. By the French Constitution, the nation is always named before the king. The third article of the Declaration of Rights says, quote, The nation is essentially the source or fountain of all sovereignty. Unquote. Mr. Burke argues that in England a king is the fountain, that he is the fountain of all honor. But as this idea is evidently descended from the conquest, I shall make no other remark upon it than that it is the nature of conquest to turn everything upside down. And as Mr. Burke will not be refused the privilege of speaking twice, and as there are but two parts in the figure, the fountain and the spout, he will be right the second time. The French Constitution puts the legislative before the executive, the law before the king, la loi, le roi. This also is in the natural order of things, because laws must have existence before they can have execution. A king in France does not, in addressing himself to the National Assembly, say, my assembly, similar to the phrase used in England of my parliament. Neither can he use it consistently with the Constitution, nor could it be admitted. There may be propriety in the use of it in England, because, as is before mentioned, both Houses of Parliament originated from what is called the Crown, by patent or boon, and not from the inherent rights of the people, as the National Assembly does in France, and whose name designates its origin. The President of the National Assembly does not ask the King to grant to the Assembly liberty of speech, as is the case with the English House of Commons. The constitutional dignity of the National Assembly cannot debase itself. Speech is, in the first place, one of the natural rights of man always retained, and with respect to the National Assembly, the use of it is their duty, and the nation is their authority. They were elected by the greatest body of men exercising the right of election the European world ever saw. They sprung not from the filth of rotten boroughs, nor are they the vassal representatives of aristocratical ones. Feeling the proper dignity of their character, they support it. Their parliamentary language, whether for or against a question, is free, bold, and manly, and extends to all parts and circumstances of the case. If any matter or subject, respecting the executive department or the person who presides in it, the king, comes before them, it is debated on with the spirit of men and in the language of gentlemen, and their answer or their address is returned in the same style. They stand not aloof with the gaping vacuity of vulgar ignorance, nor bend with the cringe of sycophantic insignificance. The graceful pride of truth knows no extremes, and preserves in every latitude of life the right-angled character of man. Let us now look to the other side of the question. In the addresses of the English parliaments to their kings, we see neither the intrepid spirit of the old parliaments of France, nor the serene dignity of the present National Assembly. 
neither do we see in them anything of the style of english manners which border somewhat on bluntness since then they are neither of foreign extraction nor naturally of english production their origin must be sought for elsewhere and that origin is the norman conquest they are evidently of the vassalage class of manners and emphatically mark the prostrate distance that exists in no other condition of men than between the conqueror and the conquered that this vassalage idea and style of speaking was not got rid of even at the revolution of sixteen eighty eight is evident from the declaration of parliament to william and mary in these words quote, we do most humbly and faithfully submit ourselves our heirs and posterities for ever submission is wholly a vassalage term repugnant to the dignity of freedom and an echo of the language used at the conquest as the estimation of all things is given by comparison the revolution of sixteen eighty eight however from circumstances it may have been exalted beyond its value will find its level it is already on the wane eclipsed by the enlarging orb of reason and the luminous revolutions of america and france in less than another century it will go as well as mr burke's labors quote, to the family vault of all the capulets unquote. mankind will then scarcely believe that a country calling itself free would send to holland for a man and clothe him with power on purpose to put themselves in fear of him and give him almost a million sterling a year for leave to submit themselves and their posterity like bondmen and bondwomen for ever but there is a truth that ought to be made known i have had the opportunity of seeing it which is that notwithstanding appearances there is not any description of men that despise monarchy so much as courtiers but they well know that if it were seen by others as it is seen by them the juggle could not be kept up they are in the condition of men who get their living by a show and to whom the folly of that show is so familiar that they ridicule it but were the audience to be made as wise in this respect as themselves there would be an end to the show and the profits with it the difference between a republican and a courtier with respect to monarchy is that one opposes monarchy believing it to be something and the other laughs at it knowing it to be nothing as i used sometimes to correspond with mr burke believing him then to be a man of sounder principles than his book shows him to be i wrote to him last winter from paris and gave him an account how prosperously matters were going on among other subjects in that letter i referred to the happy situation the national assembly were placed in that they had taken ground on which their moral duty and their political interest were united they have not to hold out a language which they do not themselves believe for the fraudulent purpose of making others believe it their station requires no artifice to support it and can only be maintained by enlightening mankind it is not their interest to cherish ignorance but to dispel it they are not in the case of a ministerial or an opposition party in england who though they are opposed are still united to keep up the common mystery the national assembly must throw open a magazine of light it must show man the proper character of man, and the nearer it can bring him to that standard, the stronger the National Assembly becomes. In contemplating the French Constitution, we see in it a rational order of things. The principles harmonize with the forms, and both with their origin. It may perhaps be said as an excuse for bad forms that they are nothing more than forms, but this is a mistake. Forms grow out of principles and operate to continue the principles they grow from it is impossible to practice a bad form on anything but a bad principle it cannot be engrafted on a good one and wherever the forms in any government are bad it is a certain indication that the principles are bad also i will here finally close this subject i began it by remarking that mr burke had voluntarily declined going into a comparison of the english and french constitutions he apologizes in page 241 for not doing it by saying that he had not time mr burke's book was upwards of eight months in hand and is extended to a volume of 366 pages as his omission does injury to his cause his apology makes it worse and men on the english side of the water will begin to consider whether there is not some radical defect in what is called the english constitution that made it necessary for mr burke to suppress the comparison to avoid bringing it into view as mr burke has not written on constitutions so neither has he written on the french revolution he gives no account of its commencement or its progress 
he only expresses his wonder. Quote, it looks, says he, to me, as if I were in a great crisis, not of the affairs of France alone, but of all Europe, perhaps of more than Europe. All circumstances taken together, the French Revolution is the most astonishing that has hitherto happened in the world. Unquote. As wise men are astonished at foolish things, and other people at wise ones, I know not on which ground to account for Mr. Burke's astonishment. But certain it is that he does not understand the French Revolution. It has apparently burst forth like a creation from a chaos. But it is no more than the consequence of a mental revolution priorly existing in France. The mind of the nation had changed beforehand, and the new order of things has naturally followed the new order of thoughts. I will here, as concisely as I can, trace out the growth of the French Revolution, and mark the circumstances that have contributed to produce it. The despotism of Louis the Fourteenth, united with the gaiety of his court and the gaudy ostentation of his character, had so humbled and at the same time so fascinated the mind of France that the people appeared to have lost all sense of their own dignity in contemplating that of their grand monarch, and the whole reign of Louis the Fifteenth, remarkable only for weakness and effeminacy, made no other alteration than that of spreading a sort of lethargy over the nation from which it showed no disposition to rise. The only signs which appeared to the spirit of liberty during those periods are to be found in the writings of the French philosophers. Montesquieu, president of the Parliament of Bordeaux, went as far as a writer under a despotic government could well proceed, and being obliged to divide himself between principle and prudence, his mind often appears under a veil, and we ought to give him credit for more than he has expressed. Voltaire, who was both the flatterer and the satirist of despotism, took another line. His forte lay in exposing and ridiculing the superstitions which priestcraft, united with statecraft, had interwoven with governments. It is not from the purity of his principles or his love of mankind, for satire and philanthropy are not naturally concordant, but from his strong capacity of seeing folly in its true shape and his irresistible propensity to expose it, that he made those attacks. They were, however, as formidable as if the motive had been virtuous, and he merits the thanks rather than the esteem of mankind. On the contrary, we find in the writings of Rousseau and the Abbe Raynal a loveliness of sentiment in favor of liberty that excites respect and elevates the human faculties, but having raised this animation, they do not direct its operation, and leave the mind in love with an object without describing the means of possessing it. The writings of Quesnay, Turgot, and the friends of those authors are of the serious kind, but they labored under the same disadvantage with Montesquieu. Their writings abound with moral maxims of government, but are rather directed to economize and reform the administration of the government than the government itself. But all those writings, and many others, had their weight, and by the different manner in which they treated the subject of government, Montesquieu by his judgment and knowledge of laws, Voltaire by his wit, Rousseau and Raynal by their animation, and Quesnay and Turgot by their moral maxims and systems of economy, readers of every class met with something to their taste, and a spirit of political inquiry began to diffuse itself through the nation at the time the dispute between England and the then colonies of America broke out. In the war which France afterwards engaged in, it is very well known that the nation appeared to be beforehand with the French ministry. Each of them had its view, but those views were directed to different objects. The one sought liberty, and the other retaliation on England. The French officers and soldiers who after this went to America were eventually placed in the school of freedom and learned the practice as well as the principles of it by heart. As it was impossible to separate the military events which took place in America from the principles of the American Revolution, the publication of those events in France necessarily connected themselves with the principles which produced them. Many of the facts were in themselves principles, such as the Declaration of American Independence and the Treaty of Alliance between France and America, which recognized the natural rights of man and justified resistance to oppression. The then Minister of France, Count Vergen was not the friend of America, and it is both justice and gratitude to say that it was the Queen of France who gave the cause of America a fashion at the French court. Count Vergen was the personal and social friend of Dr. Franklin, 
and the doctor had obtained by his sensible gracefulness a sort of influence over him but with respect to principles count vergen was a despot the situation of Dr. Franklin as minister from America to France should be taken into the chain of circumstances. The diplomatic character is of itself the narrowest sphere of society that man can act in. It forbids intercourse by the reciprocity of suspicion, and a diplomatic is a sort of unconnected atom, continually repelling and repelled. But this was not the case with Dr. Franklin. He was not the diplomatic of a court, but of man. His character as a philosopher had been long established, and his circle of society in France was universal. Count Vergen resisted for a considerable time the publication in France of American constitutions translated into the French language, but even in this he was obliged to give way to public opinion, and a sort of propriety in admitting to appear what he had undertaken to defend. The American constitutions were to liberty what a grammar is to language. They define its parts of speech and practically construct them into syntax. The peculiar situation of the then Marquis de Lafayette is another link in the great chain. He served in America as an American officer under a commission of Congress, and by the universality of his acquaintance was in close friendship with the civil government of America, as well as with the military line. He spoke the language of the country entered into the discussions on the principles of government, and was always a welcome friend at any election. When the war closed, a vast reinforcement to the cause of liberty spread itself over France by the return of the French officers and soldiers. A knowledge of the practice was then joined to the theory, and all that was wanting to give it real existence was opportunity. Man cannot, properly speaking, make circumstances for his purpose, but he always has it in his power to improve them when they occur, and this was the case in France. Monsieur Necker was displaced in May 1781, and by the ill management of the finances afterwards, and particularly during the extravagant administration of Monsieur Colon, the revenue of France, which was nearly 24 millions sterling per year, was become unequal to the expenditure not because the revenue had decreased, but because the expenses had increased, and this was a circumstance which the nation laid hold of to bring forward a revolution. The English minister, Mr. Pitt, has frequently alluded to the state of French finances in his budgets without understanding the subject. Had the French parliaments been as ready to register edicts for new taxes as an English parliament is to grant them, there had been no derangement in the finances, nor yet any revolution but this will better explain itself as I proceed. It will be necessary here to show how taxes were formerly raised in France. The king, or rather the court or ministry acting under the use of that name, framed the edicts for taxes at their own discretion, and sent them to the parliaments to be registered, for until they were registered by the parliaments they were not operative. Disputes had long existed between the court and the parliaments with respect to the extent of the parliament's authority on this head. The court insisted that the authority of parliaments went no farther than to remonstrate or show reasons against the tax, reserving to itself the right of determining whether the reasons were well or ill-founded, and in consequence thereof either to withdraw the edict as a matter of choice, or to order it to be unregistered as a matter of authority. The parliaments, on their part, insisted that they had not only a right to remonstrate, but to reject, and on this ground they were always supported by the nation. But to return to the order of my narrative, Monsieur Cologne wanted money, and as he knew the sturdy disposition of the parliaments with respect to new taxes, he ingeniously sought either to approach them by a more gentle means than that of direct authority, or to get over their heads by a maneuver and for this purpose he revived the project of assembling a body of men from the several provinces, under the style of an assembly of the notables, or men of note, who met in 1787, and who were either to recommend taxes to the parliaments, or to act as a parliament themselves. An assembly under this name had been called in 1617. As we are to view this as the first practical step toward the revolution, it will be proper to enter into some particulars respecting it. The assembly of the notables has in some places been mistaken for the states general, but was wholly a different body, the states general being always by election. The persons who composed the assembly of the notables were all nominated by the king, and consisted of 140 members, 
but as monsieur cologne could not depend upon a majority of this assembly in his favor he very ingeniously arranged them in such a manner as to make forty-four a majority of one hundred and forty to effect this he disposed of them into seven separate committees of twenty members each every general question was to be decided not by a majority of persons but by a majority of committee and as eleven votes would make a majority in a committee and four committees a majority of seven m cologne had good reason to conclude that as forty-four would determine any general question he could not be outvoted but all his plans deceived him and in the event became his overthrow the then marquis de lafayette was placed in the second committee of which the count d'artois was president and as money matters were the object it naturally brought into view every circumstance connected with it m de lafayette made a verbal charge against cologne for selling crown lands to the amount of two millions of livres in a manner that appeared to be unknown to the king the count d'artois as if to intimidate for the bastille was then in being asked the marquis if he would render the charge in writing he replied that he would the count d'artois did not demand it but brought a message from the king to that purport m de lafayette then delivered in his charge in writing to be given to the king undertaking to support it no farther proceedings were had upon this affair but Monsieur Cologne was soon after dismissed by the king and set off to England. As Monsieur de Lafayette, from the experience of what he had seen in America, was better acquainted with the science of civil government than the generality of the members who composed the assembly of the notables could then be, the brunt of the business fell considerably to his share. The plan of those who had a constitution in view was to contend with the court on the ground of taxes, and some of them openly professed their object disputes frequently arose between count d'artois and m de lafayette upon various subjects with respect to the arrears already incurred the latter proposed to remedy them by accommodating the expenses to the revenue instead of the revenue to the expenses and as objects of reform he proposed to abolish the bastille and all the state prisons throughout the nation the keeping of which was attended with great expense and to suppress letters de cachet but those matters were not then much attended to, and with respect to lettres de cachet, a majority of the nobles appeared to be in favor of them. On the subject of supplying the treasury by new taxes, the assembly declined taking the matter on themselves, concurring in the opinion that they had not authority. In a debate on this subject, M. de Lafayette said that raising money by taxes could only be done by a national assembly, freely elected by the people and acting as their representatives do you mean said the count d'artois the states general m de lafayette replied that he did will you said the count d'artois sign what you say to be given to the king the other replied that he would not only do this but that he would go farther and say that the effectual mode would be for the king to agree to the establishment of a constitution as one of the plans had thus failed that of getting the assembly to act as a parliament the other came into view that of recommending on this subject the assembly agreed to recommend two new taxes to be unregistered by the parliament the one a stamp tax and the other a territorial tax or sort of land tax the two have been estimated at about five million sterling per annum we have now to turn our attention to the parliaments on whom the business was again devolving the archbishop of toulouse since archbishop of seine and now a cardinal was appointed to the administration of the finances soon after the dismission of cologne he was also made prime minister an office that did not always exist in france when this office did not exist the chief of each of the principal departments transacted business immediately with the king but when a prime minister was appointed they did business only with him the archbishop arrived to more state authority than any minister since the duc de choiseul and the nation was strongly disposed in his favor but by a line of conduct scarcely to be accounted for he perverted every opportunity turned out a despot and sunk into disgrace and a cardinal the assembly of the notables having broken up the minister sent the edicts for the two new taxes recommended by the assembly to the parliaments to be unregistered they of course came first before the parliament of paris who returned for answer quote, that with such a revenue as the nation then supported the name of taxes ought not to be mentioned but for the purpose of reducing them unquote, and threw both the edicts out footnote when the english prime minister mr pitt mentions the french finances again in the english parliament 
It would be well that he noticed this as an example. End of footnote. On this refusal, the Parliament was ordered to Versailles, where, in the usual form, the King held what under the old government was called a bed of justice, and the two edicts were unregistered in presence of the Parliament by an order of state, in the manner mentioned earlier. On this, the Parliament immediately returned to Paris, renewed their session in form, and ordered the unregistering to be struck out, declaring that everything done at Versailles was illegal. All the members of the Parliament were then served with letters to Cachet, an exile to Troy, but they continued as inflexible in exile as before, and as vengeance did not supply the place of taxes, they were, after a short time, recalled to Paris. The edicts were again tendered to them, and the Count d'Artois undertook to act as representative of the king. For this purpose he came from Versailles to Paris in a train of procession, and the Parliament were assembled to receive him. But show and parade had lost their influence in France, and whatever ideas of importance he might set off with, he had to return with those of mortification and disappointment. On alighting from his carriage to ascend the steps of the Parliament House, the crowd, which was numerously collected, threw out trite expressions, saying, This is Monsieur d'Artois, who wants more of our money to spend. The marked disapprobation which he saw impressed him with apprehensions, and the word a arms to arms was given out by the officer of the guard who attended him. It was so loudly vociferated that it echoed through the avenues of the house and produced a temporary confusion. I was then standing in one of the apartments through which he had to pass, and could not avoid reflecting how wretched was the condition of a disrespected man. He endeavored to impress the Parliament by great words, and opened his authority by saying, quote, The King, our Lord and Master, unquote. The Parliament received him very coolly, and with their usual determination not to register the taxes and in this manner the interview ended. After this, a new subject took place, in the various debates and contests which arose between the court and the parliaments on the subject of taxes, the Parliament of Paris at last declared that although it had been customary for parliaments to unregister edicts for taxes as a matter of convenience, the right belonged only to the States General, and that therefore the Parliament could no longer with propriety continue to debate on what it had not authority to act. The king after this came to Paris and held a meeting with the Parliament, in which he continued from ten in the morning till about six in the evening, and in a manner that appeared to proceed from him as if unconsulted upon with the cabinet or ministry, gave his word to the Parliament that the States General should be convened. But after this, another scene arose, on a ground different from all the former. The minister and the cabinet were averse to calling the States General. They well knew that if the States General were assembled, themselves must fall, and as the King had not mentioned any time, they hit on a project calculated to elude without appearing to oppose. For this purpose, the Court set about making a sort of constitution itself. It was principally the work of Monsieur Lamoignon, the Keeper of the Seals, who afterwards shot himself. This new arrangement consisted in establishing a body under the name of a corps plénière or full court, in which were invested all the powers that the government might have occasion to make use of. The persons composing this court were to be nominated by the king. The contended right of taxation was given up on the part of the king, and a new criminal code of laws and law proceedings was substituted in the room of the former. The thing, in many points, contained better principles than those upon which the government had hitherto been administered. But with respect to the corps plénière, it was no other than a medium through which despotism was to pass without appearing to act directly from itself. The cabinet had high expectations from their new contrivance. The people who were to compose the corps plénière were already nominated, and as it was necessary to carry a fair appearance, many of the best characters in the nation were appointed among the number. It was to commence on May 8, 1788, but an opposition arose to it on two grounds, the one as to principle, the other as to form. On the ground of principle, it was contended that government had not a right to alter itself, and that if the practice was once admitted, it would grow into a principle and be made precedent for any future alterations the government might wish to establish, that the right of altering the government was a national right and not a right of the government. And on the ground of form, it was contended that the corps plénière was nothing more than a larger cabinet. The then Duc de la Rochefoucauld, Luxembourg, Denois, and many others refused to accept the nomination, 
and strenuously opposed the whole plan. When the edict for establishing this new court was sent to the parliaments to be unregistered and put into execution, they resisted also. The Parliament of Paris not only refused, but denied the authority, and the contest renewed itself between the Parliament and the Cabinet more strongly than ever. While the Parliament were sitting in debate on this subject, the Ministry ordered a regiment of soldiers to surround the house and form a blockade. The members sent out for beds and provisions and lived as in a besieged citadel, and as this had no effect, the commanding officer was ordered to enter the Parliament House and seize them, which he did and some of the principal members were shut up in different prisons. About the same time, a deputation of persons arrived from the province of Brittany to remonstrate against the establishment of the corps plenière and those the archbishop sent to the Bastille. But the spirit of the nation was not to be overcome, and it was so fully sensible of the strong ground it had taken, that of withholding taxes, that it contented itself with keeping up a sort of quiet resistance, which effectually overthrew all the plans at that time formed against it. The project of the corps plenière was at last obliged to be given up, and the prime minister not long afterwards followed its fate, and Monsieur Necker was recalled into office. The attempt to establish the corps plenière had an effect upon the nation which itself did not perceive. It was a sort of new form of government that insensibly served to put the old one out of sight and to unhinge it from the superstitious authority of antiquity. It was government dethroning government, and the old one, by attempting to make a new one, made a chasm. The failure of this scheme renewed the subject of convening the state general, and this gave rise to a new series of politics. There was no settled form for convening the state general. All that it positively meant was a deputation from what was then called the clergy, the noblesse and the commons, but their numbers or their proportions had not always been the same. They had been convened only on extraordinary occasions, the last of which was in 1614. Their numbers were then in equal proportions, and they voted by orders. It could not well escape the sagacity of M. Necker that the mode of 1614 would answer neither the purpose of the then government nor of the nation. As matters were at that time circumstanced, it would have been too contentious to agree upon anything. The debates would have been endless upon privileges and exemptions, in which neither the wants of the government nor the wishes of the nation for a constitution would have been attended to. But as he did not choose to take the decision upon himself, he summoned again the assembly of the notables and referred it to them. This body was in general interested in the decision, being chiefly of aristocracy and high-paid clergy, and they decided in favor of the mode of 1614. This decision was against the sense of the nation and also against the wishes of the court, for the aristocracy opposed itself to both and contended for privileges independent of either. The subject was then taken up by the Parliament, who recommended that the number of the commons should be equal to the other two, and they should all sit in one house and vote in one body. The number finally determined on was 1,200, 600 to be chosen by the commons, and this was less than their proportion ought to have been when their worth and consequence is considered on a national scale. 300 by the clergy and 300 by the aristocracy. But with respect to the mode of assembling themselves, whether together or apart, or the manner in which they should vote, those matters were referred. Footnote. Mr. Burke, and I must take the liberty of telling him that he is very unacquainted with French affairs, speaking upon this subject says, quote, The first thing that struck me in calling the States General was a great departure from the ancient course, unquote. And he soon after says, quote, From the moment I read the list, I saw distinctly, and very nearly as it happened, all that was to follow, unquote. Mr. Burke certainly did not see what was to follow. I endeavored to impress him, as well before as after the States General met, that there would be a revolution, but was not able to make him see it. Neither would he believe it. How, then, he could distinctly see all the parts when the whole was out of sight is beyond my comprehension. And with respect to the departure from the ancient course, besides the natural weakness of the remark, it shows that he is unacquainted with circumstances. The departure was necessary from the experience had upon it that the ancient course was a bad one. The States General of 1614 were called at the commencement of the Civil War in the minority of Louis XIII but by the class arranging themselves by orders, they increased the confusion they were called to compose. The author of L'Intrigue du Cabinet, Intrigue of the Cabinet, 
who wrote before any revolution was thought of in France, speaking of the States General of 1614, says, quote, They held the public in suspense five months, and by the questions agitated therein, and the heat with which they were put, it appears that the great Le Grand thought more to satisfy their particular passions than to procure the goods of the nation, and the whole time passed away in altercations, ceremonies, and parade. Unquote. L'Intrigue du Cabinet, Volume 1, page 329. End of footnote. The election that followed was not a contested election, but an animated one. The candidates were not men, but principals. Societies were formed in Paris, and committees of correspondence and communication established throughout the nation for the purpose of enlightening the people, and explaining to them the principles of civil government, and so orderly was the election conducted that it did not give rise even to the rumor of tumult. The States General were to meet at Versailles in April 1789, but did not assemble till May. They situated themselves in three separate chambers, or rather the clergy and aristocracy withdrew each into a separate chamber. The majority of the aristocracy claimed what they called the privilege of voting as a separate body, and of giving their consent or their negative in that manner, and many of the bishops and the high-beneficed clergy claimed the same privilege on the part of their order. The tiers atat, as they were then called, disowned any knowledge of artificial orders and artificial privileges, and they were not only resolute on this point, but somewhat disdainful. They began to consider the aristocracy as a kind of fungus growing out of the corruption of society that could not be admitted even as a branch of it, and from the disposition the aristocracy had shown by upholding letters de cachet and in sundry other instances, it was manifest that no constitution could be formed by admitting men in any other character than as national men. After various altercations on this head, the tiers atat or commons, as they were then called, declared themselves on a motion made for that purpose by the Abbe Sier, quote, the representative of the nation, and that the two orders could be considered but as deputies of corporations, and could only have a deliberate voice when they assembled in a national character with the national representatives, unquote. This proceeding extinguished the style of atats généraux, or states general, and erected it into the style it now bears, that of l'Assemblée Nationale, or National Assembly. This motion was not made in a precipitate manner. It was the result of cool deliberation and concerned between the national representatives and the patriotic members of the two chambers, who saw into the folly, mischief, and injustice of artificial privileged distinctions. It was become evident that no constitution worthy of being called by that name could be established on anything less than a national ground. The aristocracy had hitherto opposed the despotism of the court and affected the language of patriotism, but it opposed it as its rival, as the English barons opposed King John, and it now opposed the nation from the same motives. On carrying this motion, the national representatives, as had been concerted, sent an invitation to the two chambers to unite with them in a national character and proceed to business. A majority of the clergy, chiefly of the parish priests, withdrew from the clerical chamber and joined the nation, and forty-five from the other chamber joined in like manner. There is a sort of secret history belonging to this last circumstance which is necessary to its explanation. It was not judged prudent that all the patriotic members of the chamber styling itself the nobles should quit it at once, and in consequence of this arrangement they drew off by degrees, always leaving some, as well to reason the case as to watch the suspected. In a little time the numbers increased from forty-five to eighty, and soon after to a greater number, which, with the majority of the clergy and the whole of the national representatives, put the malcontents in a very diminutive condition. The king, who, very different from the general class called by that name, is a man of good heart, showed himself disposed to recommend a union of the three chambers, on the ground the National Assembly had taken, but the malcontents exerted themselves to prevent it and began now to have another project in view. Their numbers consisted of a majority of the aristocratical chamber and the minority of the clerical chamber, chiefly of bishops and high-beneficed clergy, and these men were determined to put everything to issue, as well by strength as by stratagem. They had no objection to a constitution, but it must be such a one they themselves should dictate, and suited to their own views and particular situations, 
On the other hand, the nation disowned knowing anything of them but as citizens, and was determined to shut out all such upstart pretensions. The more aristocracy appeared, the more it was despised. There was a visible imbecility and want of intellects in the majority, a sort of je ne sais quoi, that while it affected to be more than citizen was less than man. It lost ground from contempt more than from hatred, and was rather jeered at as an ass than dreaded as a lion. This is the general character of aristocracy, or what are called nobles or nobility, or rather no ability, in all countries. The plan of the malcontents consisted now of two things, either to deliberate and vote by chambers or orders, more especially on all questions respecting a constitution, by which the aristocratical chamber would have had a negative on any article of the constitution, or, in case they could not accomplish this object to overthrow the National Assembly entirely. To effect one or the other of these objects, they began to cultivate a friendship with the despotism they had hitherto attempted to rival, and the Count d'Artois became their chief. The king, who has since declared himself deceived in their measures, held, according to the old form, a bed of justice, in which he accorded to the deliberation and vote partet by head upon several subjects but reserved the deliberation and vote upon all questions respecting a constitution to the three chambers separately. This declaration of the king was made against the advice of Monsieur Necker, who now began to perceive that he was growing out of fashion at court and that another minister was in contemplation. As the form of sitting in separate chambers was yet apparently kept up, though essentially destroyed, the national representatives immediately after this declaration of the king resorted to their own chambers to consult on a protest against it, and the minority of the chamber calling itself the nobles, who had joined in the national cause, retired to a private house to consult in like manner. The malcontents had by this time concerted their measures with the court, which the Count d'Artois undertook to conduct, and as they saw from the discontent which the declaration excited and the opposition making against it, that they could not obtain a control over the intended constitution by a separate vote, they prepared themselves for their final object, that of conspiring against the National Assembly and overthrowing it. The next morning, the door of the chamber of the National Assembly was shut against them and guarded by troops, and the members were refused admittance. On this, they withdrew to a tennis ground in the neighborhood of Versailles as the most convenient place they could find, and after renewing their session, took an oath never to separate from each other under any circumstance whatever, death excepted, until they had established a constitution. As the experiment of shutting up the house had no other effect than that of producing a closer connection in the members, it was opened again the next day, and the public business recommenced in the usual place. We are now to have in view the forming of the new ministry, which was to accomplish the overthrow of the National Assembly. But as force would be necessary, Orders were issued to assemble 30,000 troops, the command of which was given to Broglio, one of the intended new ministry, who was recalled from the country for this purpose. But as some management was necessary to keep this plan concealed till the moment it should be ready for execution, it is to this policy that a declaration made by Count d'Artois must be attributed, and which is here proper to be introduced. It could not but occur, while the malcontents continued to resort to their chambers separate from the National Assembly, more jealousy would be excited than if they were mixed with it, and that the plot might be suspected. But as they had taken their ground, and now wanted a pretense for quitting it, it was necessary that one should be devised. This was effectually accomplished by a declaration made by the Count d'Artois, quote, that if they took not a part in the National Assembly, the life of the king would be endangered, unquote, on which they quitted their chambers and mixed with the assembly in one body. At the time this declaration was made, it was generally treated as a piece of absurdity in Count d'Artois calculated merely to relieve the outstanding members of the two chambers from the diminutive situation they were put in, and if nothing more had followed, this conclusion would have been good. But as things best explain themselves by their events, this apparent union was only a cover to the machinations which were secretly going on, and the declaration accommodated itself to answer that purpose. In a little time, the National Assembly found itself surrounded by troops, and thousands more were daily arriving. On this, a very strong declaration was made by the National Assembly to the King, remonstrating on the impropriety of the measure and demanding the reason. The King, who was not in the secret of this business, as himself afterwards declared, 
gave substantially for answer that he had no other object in view than to preserve the public tranquillity, which appeared to be much disturbed. But in a few days from this time the plot unraveled itself. Monsieur Necker and the ministry were displaced, and a new one formed of the enemies of the revolution. And Broglio, with between twenty-five and thirty thousand foreign troops, was arrived to support them. The mask was now thrown off, and matters were come to a crisis. The event was that, in a space of three days, the new ministry and their abettors found it prudent to fly the nation. The Bastille was taken, and Broglio and his foreign troops dispersed, as is already related in the former part of this work. There are some curious circumstances in the history of this short-lived ministry and this short-lived attempt at a conal revolution. The Palace of Versailles, where the court was sitting, was not more than 400 yards distant from the hall where the National Assembly was sitting. The two places were at this moment like the separate headquarters of two combatant armies, yet the court was as perfectly ignorant of the information which had arrived from Paris to the National Assembly as if it had resided at a hundred miles distant. The then Marquis de Lafayette, who, as has already been mentioned, was chosen to preside in the National Assembly on this particular occasion, named by the order of the assembly three successive deputations to the king on the day and up to the evening on which the bastille was taken to inform and confer with him on the state of affairs but the ministry who knew not so much as that it was attacked precluded all communication and were solacing themselves how dexterously they had succeeded but in a few hours the accounts arrived so thick and fast that they had to start from their desks and run some set off in one disguise, and some in another, and none in their own character. Their anxiety now was to outride the news, lest they should be stopped, which, though it flew fast, flew not so fast as themselves. It is worth remarking that the National Assembly neither pursued those fugitive conspirators, nor took any notice of them, nor sought to retaliate in any shape whatever. Occupied with establishing a constitution founded on the rights of man and the authority of the people, the only authority on which government has a right to exist in any country, the National Assembly felt none of those mean passions which mark the character of impertinent governments, founding themselves on their own authority, or on the absurdity of hereditary succession. It is the faculty of the human mind to become what it contemplates, and to act in unison with its object. The conspiracy being thus dispersed, one of the first works of the National Assembly, instead of vindictive proclamations, as has been the case with other governments, was to publish a declaration of the rights of man as the basis on which the new constitution was to be built, and which is here subjoined. Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizens by the National Assembly of France The representatives of the people of France, formed into a national assembly, considering that ignorance, neglect, or contempt of human rights are the sole causes of public misfortunes and corruptions of government, have resolved to set forth in a solemn declaration these natural, imprescriptible, and inalienable rights, that this declaration being constantly present to the minds of the members of the body social, they may be forever kept attentive to their rights and their duties, that the acts of the legislative and executive powers of government being capable of being every moment compared with the end of political institutions may be more respected, and also that the future claims of the citizens, being directed by simple and incontestable principles, may always tend to the maintenance of the Constitution and the general happiness. For these reasons, the National Assembly doth recognize and declare, in the presence of the Supreme Being, and with the hope of his blessing and favor, the following sacred rights of men and citizens. 1. Men are born, and always continue, free and equal in respect of their rights. Civil distinctions, therefore, can be founded only on public utility. 2. The end of all political associations is the preservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man, and these rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance of oppression. 3. The nation is essentially the source of all sovereignty, nor can any individual or any body of men be entitled to any authority which is not expressly derived from it. 4. Political liberty consists in the power of doing whatever does not injure another. The exercise of the natural rights of every man has no other limits than those which are necessary to secure to every other man the free exercise of the same rights, and these limits are determinable only by the law. 5. The law ought to prohibit only actions hurtful to society. What is not prohibited by the law should not be hindered, 
nor should anyone be compelled to that which the law does not require. 6. The law is an expression of the will of the community. All citizens have a right to concur, either personally or by their representatives, in its formation. It should be the same to all, whether it protects or punishes, and all being equal in its sight are equally eligible to all honors, places, and employments, according to their different abilities, without any other distinction than that created by their virtues and talents. 7. No man should be accused, arrested, or held in confinement, except in cases determined by the law, and according to the forms which it is prescribed. All who promote, solicit, execute, or cause to be executed arbitrary orders ought to be punished, and every citizen called upon or apprehended by virtue of the law ought immediately to obey and renders himself culpable by resistance. 8. The law ought to impose no other penalties, but such are absolutely and evidently necessary, and no one ought to be punished but in virtue of a law promulgated before the offense and legally applied. 9. Every man being presumed innocent till he has been convicted, whenever his detention becomes indispensable, all rigor to him, more than is necessary to secure his person, ought to be provided against by the law. 10. No man ought to be molested on account of his opinions, not even on account of his religious opinions, provided his avowal of them does not disturb the public order established by the law. 11. The unrestrained communication of thoughts and opinions being one of the most precious rights of man, every citizen may speak, write, and publish freely, provided he is responsible for the abuse of this liberty in cases determined by the law. 12. A public force being necessary to give security to the rights of men and of citizens, that force is instituted for the benefit of the community, and not for the particular benefit of the persons to whom it is entrusted. 13. A common contribution being necessary for the support of the public force, and for defraying the other expenses of government, it ought to be divided equally among the members of the community according to their abilities. 14. Every citizen has a right, either by himself or his representative, to a free voice in determining the necessity of public contributions, the appropriation of them, and their amount, mode of assessment, and duration. 15. Every community has a right to demand of all its agents an account of their conduct. 16. Every community in which a separation of powers and a security of rights is not provided for wants a constitution. 17. The right to property being inviolable and sacred, no one ought to be deprived of it except in cases of evident public necessity, legally ascertained, and on condition of a previous just indemnity. Observations on the Declaration of Rights the first three articles comprehend, in general terms, the whole of a Declaration of Rights. All the succeeding articles either originate from them or follow as elucidations. The fourth, fifth, and sixth define more particularly what is only generally expressed in the first, second, and third. The seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh articles are declaratory of principles upon which laws shall be constructed, conformable to rights already declared. But it is questioned by some very good people in France, as well as in other countries, whether the tenth article sufficiently guarantees the right is intended to accord with, besides which it takes off from the divine dignity of religion, and weakens its operative force upon the mind, to make it a subject of human laws. It then presents itself to man like light intercepted by a cloudy medium, in which the source of it is obscured from his sight, and he sees nothing to reverence in the dusky ray. Footnote. There is a single idea which, if it strikes rightly upon the mind, either in a legal or a religious sense, will prevent any man or any body of men, or any government, from going wrong on the subject of religion, which is that before any human institutions of government were known in the world, there existed, if I may so express it, a compact between God and man from the beginning of time, and that is the relation and condition which man in his individual person stands in towards his maker cannot be changed by any human laws or human authority. That religious devotion, which is a part of this compact, cannot so much as be made a subject of human laws, and that all laws must conform themselves to this prior existing compact, and not assume to make the compact conform to the laws, which, besides being human, are subsequent thereto. The first act of man, when he looked around and saw himself a creature which he did not make, and a world furnished for his reception, must have been devotion, 
and devotion must ever continue sacred to every individual man as it appears right to him and the governments do mischief by interfering end of footnote the remaining articles beginning with the twelfth are substantially contained in the principles of the preceding articles but in the particular situation in which france then was having to undo what was wrong as well as to set up what was right it was proper to be more particular than what in another condition of things would be necessary while the declaration of rights was before the national assembly some of its members remarked that if a declaration of rights were published it should be accompanied by a declaration of duties the observation discovered a mind that reflected and it only erred by not reflecting far enough a declaration of rights is by reciprocity a declaration of duties also whatever is my right as a man is also the right of another and it becomes my duty to guarantee as well as to possess the first three articles are the base of liberty as well individual as national nor can any country be called free whose government does not take its beginning from the principles they contain and continue to preserve them pure and the whole of the declaration of rights is of more value to the world and will do more good than all the laws and statutes that have yet been promulgated in the declaratory exordium which prefaces the declaration of rights we see the solemn and majestic spectacle of a nation opening its commission under the auspices of its creator to establish a government a scene so new and so transcendentally unequalled by anything in the european world that the name of a revolution is diminutive of its character and it rises into a regeneration of man what are the present governments of europe but a scene of iniquity and oppression what is that of england do not its own inhabitants say it is a market where every man has his price and where corruption is common traffic at the expense of a deluded people no wonder then that the french revolution is traduced had it confined itself merely to the destruction of flagrant despotism perhaps mr burke and some others had been silent their cry now is it has gone too far that is it has gone too far for them it stares corruption in the face and the venal tribe are all alarmed their fear discovers itself in their outrage and they are but publishing the groans of a wounded vice but from such opposition the french revolution instead of suffering receives an homage the more it is struck the more sparks it will emit and the fear is it will not be struck enough it has nothing to dread from attacks truth has given it an establishment and time will record it with a name as lasting as his own having now traced the progress of the french revolution through most of its principal stages from its commencement to the taking of the bastille and its establishment by the declaration of rights i will close the subject with the energetic apostrophe of m de lafayette quote, may this great monument raised to liberty serve as a lesson to the oppressor and an example to the oppressed unquote. footnote see this work part one starting at line number 254 note well since the taking of the bastille the occurrences have been published but the matters recorded in this narrative are prior to that period and some of them as may be easily seen can be but very little known end of footnote end of section 31 recording by colleen mcmahon